Welcome to CS55. We are four stories up right outside my classroom, the home to Let's Learn with Mr. Ritz. You see here, we feature Green Brahms machine around the world, including the UAE, Hong Kong, Denver, Brooklyn, Egypt, Chicago, Ohio, 675 schools, and welcome. We are now inside of my classroom, known as the National Health, Wellness, and Learning Center. This classroom is a converted, abandoned library. Initially, many years ago, my goal was to grow 30,000 heads of lettuce, four stories up in the middle of public housing, but instead we created a classroom. And everything that you see in this classroom was carried upstairs, from the pens, the pencils, the crayons, movable bookcases, watering cans with pencils growing out, 150 donated computers that we can give kids access to the internet, both in school and out school, you see we have group collaborations of desks so that kids work both individually and collaboratively. We have a huge teaching desk over here. Of course, our world famous fish tank, which has 55 fish named after 55 of our students here at Community School 55. Our Promethean board, our Stegosaurus dinosaur, some of the innovations that we love to feature here include all sorts of growing technology, whether it is remote activated or something as simple and brilliant as this. And I want you to realize that I'm going to unveil this grow tent with two grow racks that is responsible for every single plant that you're going to see downstairs in the school garden. But with some simple shelving and some low cost LED lights, we are able to generate thousands, I mean thousands of seedlings each and every month, right here in a teeny tiny space. And again, everything that you see here requires no construction. Right here is our NFT system where our children grow strawberries, a plant that started in this room three inches in 2013 has now blossomed into this. We have some amazing bits of accolades. Recently, I was awarded um, from the New York State Assembly a proclamation dedicated to the service that we've been able to provide here at the school. We have the shoes worn by Mr. Met at the World Series in 1985. Of course, there's, you know, we're launching a campaign called Be Your Own Hero. And I wanna focus on that because everyone needs to be our own, their own hero. But here we like to celebrate our local heroes and whether it is Mayor Adams, uh, the Pope, Oprah Winfrey, President Clinton, uh, Mrs. Obama, uh, Dr. Betty Rosa, former mayors, former chancellors, Jennifer Lopez, Joe Lampel, which by the way, this classroom is home to the first Emmy Award in New York City history. Um, we're home to two back-to-back -back social innovation awards. And of course, our favorite Reverend, the Reverend Al, who I taught to say, no justice, no peace. So Rev's been here. Um, we've got fossils and souvenirs from around the world that try to bring as much of the world into our classroom and send a good message of hope and inspiration outward. This is Dr. Bones. Dr. Bones, it's important to take care of your body. We've got two gold medals here, along with hats and souvenirs from around the world. And here is our tower garden technology, where we are growing four stories up in the middle, regardless of seasonality, using 90% less water and 90% less space. The children grow 37 kinds of fresh fruits, vegetables, and herbs here all year long, en route to outstanding academic success. Of course, aligned to our Green Bronx Machine classroom curriculum. Here we have an amazing grow yak rack unit where we literally grow 30 bags of prescriptive leafy greens and microgreens for senior citizens who live right outside, who are both food insecure and recovering from cancer. And this is one of the most important things we can do, teaching children that food is medicine and medicine is food. And for these young people to be able to feed six seniors and see them recover and then come back to school as community volunteers is awesome sauce. Right back here is our bicycle power generation station. You can get on these bicycles and literally program into the computer what you ate for breakfast and see how long you have to use it. You can get on the TV screen and go to the Google map and see you can ride your way around the world. The bicycles, they power the blenders, the energy station, all the different lights so children can understand how much energy is used with different kind of lighting. We even have a battery charging system so children get on the bikes and understand how much energy they can generate to charge their laptops and their cell phones. We have a rocket capable of going up to 100 miles an hour that runs on people power 
and a beach ball that you could rise all the way up depending on pedal power. All of this was built, innovated, and iterated right here in the classroom. No expensive technology, just people power. Of course, right here is our Grain Bronze Machine Mobile Classroom Kitchen. This is a food truck on wheels, complete with a sink, a kitchen, an oven, a stove, a boiler, a broiler, a refrigerator, a bain marie, and most importantly, a TV broadcasting center. Home to our tower, to table, to tummy TV series. And literally the children harvest the food there, they bring it here, they cook it here, and they eat it right there. Zero miles to plate. The healthiest, freshest, most nutritious food you can imagine. We also have a three compartment sink to teach adults and parents and supervisors how to become qualified food handling certified professionals. So this is our world. Welcome. I couldn't be happier to be here and share it with you today. Um, the paint was researched so that children feel great, excited and energized. We picked green and blue because in Native American culture, green and blue is the same color. It represents where the earth meets the sea. And welcome from the Bronx to the world. Si se puede. Thanks for visiting. Come visit. You heard? My name is Stephen Ritz and I am the founder of Green Bronx Machine. And simply put, Green Bronx Machine is a locally born organization that is hyper local and hyper connected. But I like to say we grow vegetables, our vegetables grow students, our students grow schools and our schools grow happy, healthy, resilient communities. And right here in the middle of public housing in a hundred year old building, we have converted a library four stories up into an incredible global epicenter of curriculum farming inspiration, motivation, and perspiration that is growing something greater. So we go from a box to a garden in 45 minutes if you're a man, and 15 minutes if you're a woman, because you'll read the directions and watch the video. But through our proprietary curriculum, the Green Bronx Machine Classroom curriculum, it is the art and science of growing vegetables in communities that have limited means and limited access to them aligned to every aspect of school performance. So yes, we are the garden people. Yes, we are the cooking people. But what we really are, are the school people. And 600 plus schools across the nation and around the world, our schools outperform their peer index neighbors on the top 10 critical indicators of school performance. And we have happy, healthy children who love growing and eating vegetables en route to outstanding academic performance and change behavioral health outcomes. So we are literally growing something greater. First and foremost, there is a Bronx in every city in America. And we represent the most marginalized of communities. And, you know, for example, the Bronx, you know, the Bronx is the most maligned borough, you know, in New York City history. But the Bronx is home to amazing people. And the calculus of our advocacy, the calculus of my advocacy is not to be my brother's keeper, but to be my brother's brother. So for far too long, we've seen communities like ours not only under-resourced, but over-extracted. And there is a sense of purpose and design that facilitates communities like ours being dependent upon others and not independent and self-sufficient. So we are the basis for an economy around the world while the discrepancy between where we are and what we have continues to grow and people are getting rich off that while this community and communities across America continue to suffer. To think that we don't have access to fresh food, that it is easier to get liquor than it is to get lettuce, um, that food prices here, that the clown, the king and the colonel are on every single corner, but small mom and pop shops have been driven out by fake real estate prices. Cheap food, cheap and convenient is so costly. And who is it killing? It is killing us. It is really killing our communities, but enabling an ongoing economy to think that poverty and obesity are synonymous because we are consuming cheap and calorie rich processed food, crap calorie rich and processed food and manufactured edible synthetic substances under the myth of living in a food desert, you know, and, and let's be real, it's not a food desert. 
because a desert is a viable ecosystem. I've been to the desert. In the desert, the animals that live there and the organisms that live there thrive. This isn't a desert, this is a swamp. We've got 50 flavors of crap behind bulletproof windows everywhere. The way these communities and communities like ours are marketed to is insidious. You know, the amount of sugar-sweetened beverages, celebrity endorsements, you don't see this in Scarsdale. You don't see this on the Upper West Side. You know, three short miles, but five long degrees of separation come between here, the poorest congressional district in America, and some of the wealthiest zip codes in the nation. So I'm out to change that. And where does it start? It starts in schools, and it starts with public education. Because public education is the greatest lever this nation has, and all nations have towards equity. So, yes, we grow vegetables. Yes, we do happy children. Yes, we teach people how to cook and how to eat. Because let me be clear, children will never be well-read if they're not well-fed. And the most important school supply in the world is food. But what we really want are high-performing public schools, places where children love coming to learn, where aspiration, inspiration, motivation are at the basis for everything that we do so that children don't have to leave their neighborhood to live, learn, and earn in a better one, but they can plant their stake right in the ground where they live and grow something greater. In a community that has traditionally not been invited to the table in so many ways, here in the South Bronx, we've grown not only our own table, but an entire kitchen and a farm, and that's what this is about, resiliency. It's not about a handout, it's about us creating a hand up and growing something greater. Well, you know, for years, people have talked about STEM, 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 STEM. But I like to say here in the South Bronx, we are cooking with steam because art is the critical piece. So I love STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Listen, these are the things that great societies, even going back to the Egyptians and the pyramids, have built themselves upon. But let us always embrace the art because art is expression, it is humanity, it's what separates us from every other creature. So, you know, whether it's the color of the walls in this community, whether it's the mural that the parents painted, whether it's the beautiful garden and message outside, art is important because expression matters. And again, in a community that is specifically marketed to and millions of dollars are spent calculating how to separate these people from their money and create false demands for products we don't need, art and teaching children to express themselves and celebrating that expression is perhaps one of the most beautiful things we can do. So attendance has always been an issue in marginalized communities. Listen, it's tough to tell a child to come to school and show up for a delayed reward five and six months later when the temptations of the street and the temptations of counterculture are right there, right there in their face, rewarding them each and every day. But what do we know here? And what do we know through the work of Green Bronze Machine? Green Bronze Machine started with a simple precept to move those who were apart from success to being a part of it. And what does that translate into? It translates into living wage jobs. We know that in the nation, there will be 40 million new jobs related specifically to STEM. In a world where fast is getting really fast and slow is getting slower daily, the type of economy and jobs that used to be no longer will be. So we've got to make children 21st century ready. And a lot of that has to do with technology. And a lot of that has to do with farming, because I'll tell you why. You know, traditional farming has been resource intense, land intense, fossil fuel intense, and labor intense. And people don't want to do it. People equate it with slavery, with migrant work. But this makes farming sexy and the ability to grow food in cities, on brown fields, off the ground, on rooftops, creates a hyper-local, hyper-connected economy that is beneficial for all and reduces the amount of food miles that food transfers and, and, and travels. So in so many ways, what we're doing here is really the way to heal ourselves and heal the planet. And when you look at what growing food does and what growing plants does, it's about nature, it's about nurture. 
You have, you have children who can't wait to come up into this classroom to see how their plants are growing. And then in some of our older, with our older students who are growing food, guess what? When you plant a seed, 30 days later, that penny becomes a $5 bill. So I've met lots of children who don't like vegetables, but I've never met a child or an adult who's allergic to money. And at the end of the day, growing food is a license to print money particularly in cities where there is a growing appetite for fresh and fresh casual and local and gourmet. So the days of institutionalized food, thank God, are moving, we're moving away from that, and as well we should, and hyper-local is really important. So we are at a perfect storm of opportunity. But again, it starts with bringing great teachers to the most marginalized communities. And how does that happen? With low cost technology that makes these classrooms attractive places to be for teachers who have the opportunity to teach anywhere. Because I want teachers to teach for a career, for a lifetime, not for a minute or two. I don't want them sucked up by a nonprofit because it's easier to be the salad guy or the lettuce guy or the cooking guy or the spaghetti guy than it is to get in there and teach these kids. Because let's be clear, both pre-pandemic and certainly post it is really hard to be a teacher. So I do want to take a moment to say, teachers, teachers change lives, thank you. And no matter what, every, every success story always points to a teacher, someone, one kind, caring adult who believed in them. And for me, my goal is to be that kind, caring adult for as many teachers and students as possible, uh, to carry, uh, to give birth to 10,000 me and 10,000 more, so that communities across America and around the world can be resilient, entrepreneurial, and independent. And that's what this movement is really all about. It's about growing your own. So teachers need tools. Students need tools. And that's why we set out to do the work that we did very intentionally. And you know, for many years I was a champion teacher, like so many champion teachers out there, and I was figuring it out literally as the plane was flying. But to scale it, you need consistent technology. So we focused first, I mean, I, my classroom, you remember, used to be literally like a, like, like a museum of wonder. It was kind of like uh, the guy in Back to the Future's basement. But that wasn't doable across the country. So what did I want? I wanted something that was low cost, scalable, replicable, and came with a support community. And that's how I got involved with Tower Garden. When I saw this garden at an agricultural show, I said, wow, I could put this into a classroom, every classroom in America and around the world. But it wasn't just enough to have a garden, because a garden is only as good as what you do with it. We needed to have curriculum. And that's when I came up with the Green Bronx Machine Classroom Curriculum. And this curriculum, had two years of beta testing. And again, for technology, go to the technology vendor. You know, plants grow, that's what they do. Technology works, that's why it sells. But what teachers need is curriculum. So we created a curriculum, it took us two years to do it. It respected and endorsed globally, and it's the art and science of growing vegetables aligned to reading, writing, math, social studies, project-based learning, and inquiry work. So the plants are gonna grow, sometimes they don't, and that's okay. You know, the secret to my success is I only post pictures of the living plants because I've killed far more plants than I've ever grown. I only post pictures of the living ones, but I've never killed a child or hurt a teacher. And that's important because having tools that teachers can use that create community aligned to technology that is available and is proven that's the secret for success. And now, you know, you look around this classroom, we have all kinds of technologies because the children use this and then they iterate, they ideate, you know, and, and they wanna hack their way into a better, brighter future. You know, what if we didn't have this? Well, when children see how it works, they deconstruct it and we're using recycled resource and upcycled materials to create our own innovations and our own inventions. You know, we have smaller ones, bigger ones, but something that works and is proven is the best way to start. And then you build concentric circles of success around it, which again, our curriculum does it. It's in multiple languages. Um, we're very disruptive, no annual fees, no tiered subscriptions. We want teachers to have tools that live for a lifetime in a school and that are turnkey. And it's literally an all-you-can-eat buffet of academic lessons complete with manipulatives, rubrics, evaluations, data collection, or you can use it a la carte. So no matter what, we want to support everybody. And our number one client are school principals. And let me be clear, school principals want one thing. 
Well, they want a bunch of things, but they are hired to generate school performance. And to think that a simple garden, a simple tool, with really well thought out, scoped, sequence, and differentiated curriculum, that's what it's all about. It's really about creating a support tool that has an infinite shelf life with a simple project-based learning activity in a classroom that children can gather around. Now, the beauty of this technology is that it really works and it grows quickly. So children are excited to see it in a world of screens and what's next and swiping and clicking. Here they get to sit and hear the water run. They get to plant their little seeds and predict and watch it grow. And 30 days later, what do you have? You have something that you can eat, that you can take home, or you can sell. That's remarkable. And again, in communities like ours, where so many of us are disconnected from our food because it comes triple layered, wrapped in 18 layers of plastic with infinite shelf life, when you teach children about nature, you teach them to nurture. And when you teach children to nurture, we as a society collectively embrace our better nature. So we're growing all kinds of things up in here, but what we're really, what we're really growing is hope, opportunity, awareness, and palates. And think about this, every time I keep a burger out of a kid's belly, there's the clown, the king, the colonel, and 50 states of fried chicken within eight square blocks of this community. But every time I keep a burger out of their belly, I'm helping them. I'm helping the planet. And by understanding how this technology works right here in our own community, we are growing the next generation of social and environmental justice advocates. And that's what this is about, civic engagement. Because 165,000 pounds of vegetables later, my favorite crop is organically grown citizens, graduates, members of the middle class, children who are going to college, children who are eating their way to good health and who are showing up in the voting booth to get people elected that serve them. Because the degree to which we resist any injustice is the degree to which we are all free. So food justice is racial justice. And food justice starts here. And, you know, there are those who will say the food system uh, is broken. I'll say it's not broken. I'll say it's doing exactly what it's designed to do. Concentrate wealth and power in the hands of a few at the expense of very many. So I think the food system is working just fine for those who designed it. But it's time to think about new food systems. And again, for me, children will never be well read if they're not well fed. So in communities where children are coming to school to get a bulk of their meals for a variety of reasons, exposing them to local food, fresh food, and healthy food is the most important thing we can do. It's really hard to teach a kid who's number one is hungry. And you know, let's talk about hunger because obesity has become the new face of hunger. You know, poverty and obesity are hand in hand because it's cheap, empty calories that are fueling people to nothing but further disease and disease. And, you know, the reality is we live in a world of abundance. We truly do. We could end hunger tomorrow. We could feed the world tomorrow. We just can't satisfy the rich. And that's really why, why hunger and poverty exist. Um, you know, Corona, if nothing else, exposed that so blatantly that you know, the, underlying, the underlying virus is racism, greed, and corruption. And in a classroom where we can grow our own food and grow our own hope, grow our own opportunity and independence becomes the greatest equalizer. So let me share how adaptable the curriculum is. My work started with overage, undercredited children. And, you know, children who were 18, 19, 20, 21 years old sometimes had children of their own and were also often reading on second and third grade reading levels. You know, I realized it was just easier to raise healthy children than fix broken men. So I came up, we, for the curriculum, we decided that we wanted to engage children. And the curriculum is every single subject. So it is English language skills, it's math, it's science, it's inquiry, it's social studies, it's art. It is fully scoped, sequenced, differentiated, and departmentalized. So you get something for everyone. It is literally an all-you-can-eat buffet with over 600 active links online. But what we realized is we wanted to start working with children who are no longer learning to read, but reading to learn so that children could be self-regulated, so that children could get on the internet and discover things and share it with teachers and get engaged in Socratic seminars and discuss. Again, 
all about civic engagement and classroom engagement. And then moving beyond engagement, which is great, because we always want to see children engaged, we really wanted to create a sense of fulfillment. Imagine kids coming to school with purpose. Imagine teachers coming excited to use a resource that really worked and was data driven. So we went for a true three to five. And what do I mean by a true three to five? We focused specifically on grades three through five, where children had independent reading skills. But what do we know in America? That by grade one, 85% of the children in America are three years behind, particularly in urban communities and in rural communities. Uh, you know, listen, I adore my nephews, I do, and they're wonderful children, but the things that they have access to simply because of who they were born to and where they live is far different than an immigrant community like this where 90% of my parents often don't speak English and don't have a high school diploma. So the things, the barriers to success, if you will, the social determinants of health often result in a deck of cards that is stacked long before the cards are even dealt. So what we did is we specifically came up with a curriculum that is true to grades three to five. It's aspirational um, for many people, but it's used in middle schools, it's used in high schools. Um, it is used by the State University of New York to train teachers in all subject areas. So I like to say we are now going pre-K to gray um, because it is workforce development. And again, one of the biggest things that we are proud of here at Green Bronx Machine, in addition to high performing schools, is 2,200 living wage jobs. Because out of this humble classroom and our network, we've partnered towards placing second opportunity adults, young people, and first opportunity adults into 2,200 living wage jobs. And when, when you think about what that means for the poorest congressional district in America, and specifically for a community that has some of the highest rates of unemployment, underemployment, and recidivism, that's game changing. That's really growing something greater. That's really planting seeds and harvesting a crop of epic proportions and addressing hunger, equity, equality, and inclusion on a ground up level in a way that also helps nourish by, by minds and bodies. So it's really been a remarkable ride. So the curriculum is three to five, but it's used in middle schools, it's used in high schools. One of the things that I overlooked, and again, that was just, you can't do everything, is I learned that I truly forgot about the little, little ones. So being in an elementary school with pre-K and 3K, teaching kids color, scope, and sequence is something that we forgot about, but we realized is an untapped gold mine. So we're going to spend a lot of time getting these youngest, youngest ones excited about plants, learning to take direction, learning about the water cycle, learning about responsibility. And that's our new frontier, because again, it's just easier to raise healthy children than fix broken men. But remarkably, you know, we have the most productive school garden in New York City per square foot. And every single plant that you see outside in that garden starts right here in this classroom with little children. Part of some of the things that we've really done is created a feeding program in partnership with Sloan Kettering Memorial Hospital, where literally our young kids grow prescriptive leafy greens for senior citizens who are food insecure and recovering from cancer. So what does that teach them? It teaches these young people that they can be part of a solution. It creates intergenerational connections, but it also really drives the notion that food is medicine and medicine can be food. Because these young people, these little seeds are growing food that they get to deliver to seniors, often whom they know, and watch them recover through healthy eating habits. And then what happens? It's a very virtuous cycle. Many of those seniors now come back to the school to read to the children. They are our eyes and ears on the community. They are our truth tellers. Um, they are my aunties and uncles and people that help grow this village greater and give input in incredible ways. So food is medicine. And for me, you know, my work has always been rooted in pushing the walls of a classroom as far out into the community as possible and bringing as much of the community in as possible. Because right here, there is no justice. There is just us. And we will grow something greater. We are the ones we're waiting for. That's what this is about.
It's about moving children in communities who for years have been preyed upon and who are nothing more than bottom end consumers of whatever is marketed to them. Moving them up that food chain to become producers, to become into changing the narrative. I'm so proud that Green Bronx Machine and our school won the first Emmy Award in New York City education history for episode 808 of Growing a Greener World. And to think right here in the middle of NYCHA, 45 buildings, it's not such a green place. But it goes to show you what happens. And then what else happens? But when you teach children about ecosystems, when you teach them about plants, when you teach them that the water that they see running out of those fire hydrants is actually a precious, precious resource and is needed to grow those plants, guess what? They really get involved and they really get engaged. And that is what it's all about, that they understand that they're part of a living, breathing ecosystem that we're all interconnected. It's not only about me, 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 but the collective we, 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 and that our rising tide lifts all boats. I see the world as a classroom, and I also see the world as a garden, a place to pollinate and grow and create bigger, bigger, bigger ecosystems. So not everyone is a farmer, but in this classroom, there is a place for every single child on the farm. And what does that look like? Well, number one, we have a TV show. So we have Let's Learn with Mr. Ritz, which was written in partnership with children and actually gives our children's voices life. It was filmed during the pandemic on a green screen with kids calling in and literally Let's Learn with Mr. Ritz enabled children who are locked up in public housing, who couldn't even come downstairs in the elevator when the electricity went down. It enabled them to see the world. It enabled them to get involved. And it was again, free on the Green Bronx Machine website and had two million views. So, you know, we started with a TV show. We started with a cooking show and, and you know, uh, tower to table to tummy. And it literally encapsulated every single thing that the students and I do right here in the classroom. We go from our tower garden to our table, our cooking table in the back, to our tummies and it literally taught children and we were delivering food. So we were delivering the ingredients to public housing and to homes and children turned, tuned in literally to learn how to prepare this food. And we were very mindful that not everyone has a stove, not everyone has a sharp knife, nor do we want young children using sharp knives. So we used safety knives and just assembly with color coded plates, which by the way, taught fractions. Um, so we got the math, what you could grow in class, what you could cook and what you could eat and made it culturally relevant because that's important too. We focused on culturally relevant foods from all the immigrant communities that we serve. And we went from tens of kids to hundreds of kids to thousands of kids. And again, free on the green bronze machine, you know, tower to table to tummy and our PBS show, Let's Learn with Mr. Ritz, which is also on our website. You know, along the way, I've been blessed to really think about the next generation. How do you take the power of one and make it 10x? And how do you take 10 and make it 100 and 100 make it 1,000? And someone approached me randomly in New York City about writing a book. So I set out to write a book. Um, it's called The Power of a Plant. And believe it or not, I never expected that I would write a book, much less have a number one bestseller. And you know, the book has gone on to fund classrooms in this program all across the world. The New York City Department of Education gave a copy to every teacher. The book has been blurbed by 45 global luminaries from Deepak Chopra to Marion Nestle to Nona Evans to Tom Colicchio to the White House chef and so many more. Um, and what does it teach? Well, it's part motivation, part perspiration, part dedication, but it shows that you know, teachers change lives and out of some of the darkest moments of anyone's life. And let me be clear, my life has not been easy um, by any stretch of the imagination. I've been asked to work elsewhere. I've been asked to graduate elsewhere. I've had to deal with tragedy and personal pain that I don't wish on anybody. But you know, that which doesn't kill us will make us stronger. So I was approached by a publisher to write a book. I thought she was crazy. She asked me to do something within 30 days. I did it overnight. And when, you know, the book became a number one bestseller. So please buy a copy of it. It's available on the Green Bronx Machine website. 100% of the proceeds support the program. And literally it's a book that's been read around the world. Um, it's been translated into multiple languages. It's even on Audible. And the craziest thing is this, um, when Audible first released it, they got a voice and I didn't like the sound of the voice. 
So I called up Audible complaining and was so animated about it. They said, do you want to be the voice? And I said, why not? So literally, uh, I'm the voice of my own book, which was interesting because I had never done anything like that before. So I'm on the learning curve. And, and it was a fascinating experience. So, you know, I'm celebrating this year a milestone birthday um, in my own life and in my children's life and in my in so many because I have literally today children and former graduates who send their kids to this school or to a Green Bronx machine school simply because they know that their child is going to get the kindness, compassion, and empathy that they need to really feel good about themselves. Because listen, no child rises to low expectations. So I would rather fail here than succeed here because I want to grow something greater. And I believe that children are so much more than the sum of their data. And test scores are important and school grades are important. But the life lessons that I learned from teachers and mentors and my parents, I stand, I sit here today on the shoulder of giants because people cared because people listened and people believed in me. And my goal is to believe in as many children as possible. And that's why I also set out and wrote this amazing children's book called Make It Happen. And you can get this book on the website. I mean, we'll even give it to you for free if there's a child who wants it. But it talks about asking for help, how you come together, how you grow something greater. Um, it shares my own personal odyssey. Because what people don't know often is, you know, they see this guy with the cheese hat. And they think, who is that crazy guy? There was a lot of pain in my life. Um, you know, 11 years ago, I was 350 pounds. Let me repeat that. I was 350 pounds with a 54 inch waist. I was a diabetic. I had a cirrhotic liver. I was on hundreds of dollars of medication a month and I was eating myself sick and stupid. And, and cheap and convenient really became costly. I wear the cheese hat because the kids called me the big cheese back then. It took a heart attack, it took a hospitalization, and it took several near-death experiences for me to realize that, wow, food is the answer. Self-choice is the answer. And that, you know, I love what Mayor Adams says, you know, it's no longer birthplace, it's breakfast, it's no longer lineage, it's lunch, and it's no longer DNA, it is dinner that helps us express our most positive traits or our most negative traits. So to think that we can really fuel ourselves and communities to success is inspiring. So that's why I want young people to realize they can make it happen, you can get the book on the website or you can reach out to me, but I'm not here to push product. What I'm here to do is push courage because this work is hard. And to teachers and administrators and parents, I take my hat off and I salute you because it's hard. It's harder now than it was when I was a child. Listen, if the recent events in society and the divisiveness of this nation don't scare you now, I don't know what will. You know, when I was a young boy, I came up in the age of civil rights and there were two water fountains but both of them had water you could drink. I've seen people of color gone from fighting for equality for fighting for existence. Think about that. Think about that. So this work is hard and it requires courage. We were proud to launch a campaign called Education Not Asphyxiation because you know racism comes in so many shapes, flavors, and colors, environmental, educational, economic, much beyond just skin color. So we want to breathe more life into all of our communities. And that's what this movement is all about. But the work, the work is hard. And to those who are doing it daily, I thank you and I salute you. Um, and what it really requires is courage. Because the opposite of courage isn't cowardice. The opposite of courage is conformity. Because even a dead fish can go with the flow. And here in the Bronx and in communities like the Bronx and around the world, we are not dead fish. We are swimming. And we want to swim back to the way life could be and should be for all of us. Inclusive, happy, healthy, in line with Mother Nature. And in a world that's driven by a triple bottom line, I am driven by a quintuple bottom line. People, planet, profit, because conscious capitalism can make a big difference. 
but progress and purpose, because every person needs purpose in their lives. Every person needs progress in their life. For me, it's about continual progress as opposed to delayed perfection. Um, so as long as I'm getting better daily and I'm showing up, that's what it's all about. And showing up is really, really very powerful. And I'm delighted to show up with this cheese hat because this hat is symbolic. It's symbolic of, you know, when I was 350 pounds and the kids called me the big cheese. But, you know, this year I celebrated taking one million pictures with children wearing this cheese hat. This cheese hat has motivated people to smile. I've had kids take a bite out of it. It's been worn at the White House. It's been worn at the Vatican. It's been worn all around the world. And people have come to love it. But what does it teach kids? It teaches kids that they can make their own brand that we don't need the latest and greatest, that something goofy, something indigenous, and something personal can create a connection that is far greater and far more meaningful than anything you can give your money away for and buy until the next coolest one comes out. So the hat is symbolic. And make no doubt about it, I fight. I fight for children who were born in places that most people would not want to be caught dead in. I fight for children who don't have a bedroom to call their own. I fight for children who rarely get dinner and never get dessert. I fight for children who have never seen a dentist. I fight for children whose monsters are real. It is tough. It has never been harder for children than it is today. So that's who I fight for. And if this simple hat, this little piece of foam can put a smile on their face and be the bridge to success, I am delighted to wear this cheese hat and will wear it till the end of perpetuity. To think that this cheese hat encouraged children to get vaccinated, encouraged parents to get a, a COVID test. When I stopped wearing it, I told everyone the cheese hat was out being COVID tested and getting his vaccination. It inspired a movement here in this community that grew and grew and grew. This is the kind of local grassroots stuff that doesn't cost a lot of money because I believe the solutions are right in front of us as long as we choose to embrace them and look to our left and look to our right. So again, the calculus of this work is not to be my brother's keeper. It is to be my brother's brother. What's the role for teachers? The role for teachers is to come in there and be your best self daily. The goal is to be the referee to keep the children between the lines, so to speak. You know, for, in, for information and content, it's out there. We don't, you don't need to be the most learned person in the world. Look, I still don't even know the formula for photosynthesis, but the children do. But what do I do? I make sure they play nice, that they stay between the lines, so to speak, that we learn how to cooperate and collaborate. To let children know that they matter is the most important thing a teacher can do. You know, Alex, I got to tell you, two cheese hats are better than one. The next stop for you is a set of green glasses. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome back. Good morning, Stephen. I'd like to ask you the same three questions that you asked Mayor Eric Adams. One, five words that describe Stephen Ritz. Passionate, committed, excited, motivated, and thoughtful. How do you keep going? How can we not keep going? Um, I keep going because I have to, because I fight. I fight for children. Um, the world keeps going. You either revolve or you die. So I, I'm determined to keep going. Now I find better ways to keep going and smarter ways to keep going and ways to both narrow the focus but increase the reach. But I will always keep going. I will fight until my very last breath. They can bury me right here in the schoolyard and, and I'll keep growing. So I always keep going. What will be your legacy? Listen, God willing, mm -hmm. my legacy will be happy, healthy children, mm -hmm. high performing schools, children who love eating their vegetables in route to outstanding academic success and personal health outcomes. Mm -hmm. You know, but on a small day, what's the legacy? Look, I got you to wear a cheese hat. So it's one cheese hat at a time, at a time one smile at a time. You know, I talk about this a lot with my wife and my daughter. And you know, I, I won't have a house to leave behind. I won't have a big estate. 
but I'll have a series of connected cities and communities that love us and adore us and adore my wife and my daughter and I, where we are home no matter where we go. But most importantly, my big goal is to leave a network of high performing public schools across the nation and around the world and to spawn the next generation of Steve Ritzes and all kinds of social and environmental justice equity warriors. That's what the legacy will be. Success, success in communities where people least expected it and a million new versions of me. Stephen, you are using a lot of metaphors and motivational and powerful phrases uh, like si se puede, yes we can, a message of hope, of urgence and resilience, or other phrases like ready, set, grow, make epic happen, uh, food is the answer. Uh, or... Be your own hero, that's what this is all about, be your own hero. Can you tell a little bit about the power of metaphors, why you bring them? Do you use them with children and how they influence our thinking? So, you know, words are very powerful. I think now more than ever, words are very pow powerful because words dictate policy. But we can't tell children they matter if we don't listen to them, if we don't equip them with the tools to speak, but also to listen and not just to listen, but to really hear. So I like to keep my messages short and actionable. Um, I, I'm a big believer in si se puede, and I'm a big believer in let's grow, and let's grow something greater. Uh, so I can't touch everyone physically to give them a pat on the back, but it's my hope through my voice and my words and through media, short, simple phrases bring everybody around the world under the tent to grow something greater for themselves to make epic happen. So I always say compassion is the new curriculum, education, not asphyxiation, and let us breathe life into all that we can do. Your advice for new teachers? My advice for new teachers is simple. Showing up is very powerful. So bring your A game daily. Look, there's enough technology and enough sources for content that in many ways, traditional teaching, you know, the sage on the stage, is obsolete. Children don't need us for content. There's books, there's the internet, there's God knows how many other first-hand sources of really powerful, concise and precise information. What children need are role models. What children need are a guide on the side. And what we all need as society is to co-create together. And my advice to teachers is to come to class each day and do something that you and your future self and all children will be proud of. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start in order to be great. And if you bring your real self and your genuine self, children recognize that. Many teachers, especially in elementary school, when they think about civic engagement, they think maybe civic engagement is more for older kids in high school or maybe at least in middle school. What's about No, 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 no. The best place to teach children that their voice matters and can have a focused input and then focused outcome is in elementary school. You know, the days of sit down, be quiet are done. And, and, and they probably never should have existed. You know, children are to be seen and not heard. No, children are to be heard and be loved and be valued and be respected. So when you teach children to speak creatively, and advocate for themselves creatively and question authority and question the status quo. What you're really doing is that rising tide lifts all boats. So I'll, I'll give you a great example. You know, we recently had a huge fast food chain build the Taj Mahal of restaurants here in, in the community with the 99 cent menu and big shiny windows in the playground. And I'm not gonna say the name because I don't wanna be sued, but it was the Taj Mahal of fast food. And of course, initially the children were so excited. It's this big glowing beacon in the middle of the hood. And wow, there's even a place for us to sit inside. But it was that chain that didn't pay farmers one penny more per pound for their tomatoes. And, you know, the children here, we grow a lot of tomatoes here. And growing tomatoes is hard. You've got to pollinate them. You've got to pick them. You've got to be patient. And one penny really is not that much money in the scheme of million dollar businesses. So 
the children were very upset. And then they realized that the farmers who weren't getting paid looked exactly like them. They looked like their aunts, their uncles, their grandparents, their moms and their dads. And they turned and said, you know, Mr. Ritz, that's not fair. And now as a teacher, you know, as parents, we traditionally don't want to hear, that's not my house, be quiet. You know, children are to be seen, not heard. But as a teacher, that's not fair are the magic words. I love hearing that's not fair. Because I turn around and say, what are you going to do about it? Oh, no, they wanted to write letters. They wanted to complain. But they did something even more important. They stayed the hell out of that store. So that our kids stayed out. They decided they weren't going to go. And not only is that sending a message to that business, but for every burger that I keep out of their belly and replace it with a local snack or something that we've grown in here or strawberries or fruit or something from a farm within 150 miles from here, it is not only a moral victory for us, it's a physical victory and a gift to our local economy and to our planet. So civic engagement starts with giving young ones choice and voice and letting them know they matter. Um, you know, I tell children each and every day, you vote with your fork, you vote with your mouth, and you vote with your wallet. And we in communities like mine and all across the nation and around the world have got to stop giving away our collective power to big corporations and people who want to do nothing more than mine our data and extract our resources. So, little kids matter. You know, teaching them to stick up for their rights is important. You know, we always say, be, never be afraid to ask for help. So let's encourage them to ask for help. Let's encourage them to think about solutions. Let us teach them that what they do affects their lives far more than what I do. I'm way closer to the end of my life uh, than the beginning. But they've got lifetimes ahead of them. So let them learn. Let them speak. Let this them breathe. This example uh, kind of shows that you are building on something that kids are born with. The a sense of justice, a sense of understanding what is fair, what is not. Let me be clear, in, in communities like mine, there is no justice. There is just us. And that's what there is, just us. You know, we have interlopers, we have, you know, fake saviors. But the real strength of our community is us, is who we are. And each and every day through that door, the next Barack Obama, the next Sandra Sotomayor, the next Eric Adams comes marching through my door. And it's our job to give them voice. You know, my classroom is not the quietest place. I believe in noisy classrooms. I believe in loud classrooms. I believe in sloppy classrooms. This isn't the military. You don't need to march in line in a procession. I mean, there's times for that. But I want this to be a place where children can aspire to a better, brighter future, to understand that they're part of something and that something is part of another something and that something is part of a greater something and that we are all interconnected. So yeah, my classrooms tend to be amoebas of you know, evolving things. You know, there are definitely uh, cell functions in there. Um, and sometimes I'm the nucleus, and sometimes I'm the vacuole. But classrooms should not be precision-based, quiet, you know, um, Torture chambers. They should be percolators. They should be like the coffee brewing. They should be like the blender mixing. You know, we should be throwing a lot of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Do you think that there is a similar sense of creativity and uh, playfulness when it comes to families and communities? For example, one phrase that caught my eye in your book is that schools should uplift not only children, but also families and communities. Well, absolutely schools should uplift families and communities. You know, I came from a very humble background, and I'm not complaining. I came from a community where basically we were all the same economic status. And you know what the most important toy I had was as a child? My friends. Um, it wasn't a material thing. It was my friends because we were all different and we all respected each other and we all went to each other's homes and we all did all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, I marvel how little kids can take a bottle or a rock and a stick or a worm or a little pill bug and turn that into an amazing toy. Um, you know, we, we don't need these big fancy things and expensive things. Society has taught us 
that we need these things, but what we really need are relationships. The most important thing I have in my life are my relationships and the relationships I'll pass down. They're not things. Look, I drive a 1994 car. Uh, you don't own things. We don't own things. Things own us. Money has no owners, only spenders. But relationships last forever. And in that regard, I am so wealthy. And what do I want to do with that wealth? Give it all away and just keep loving on everybody else. Do parents come to school? Do parents come to school. Parents love coming. I have parents, I have kids who became parents who send their kids to my school. So, of course, I like to say education should be family business. We don't want to educate a child. We want to educate the community. We want to educate the family. And particularly in communities like ours. You know, where we have so many immigrants, where we have so many people who don't have the luxury of a college education or may not have completed high school. So the ability to educate children and have children teach grandparents how to use the computer, that's a wonderful thing. And not for shopping, but for communication and information. To be able to uplift, the schools are the epicenters of these communities. That's why we call them community schools. So again, my goal is always to push the classroom as far out into the community and bring as much of the community in as possible. Listen, I can do a lot of strategic interventions, but nothing works better than a good knock on the door and a conversation with grandma, let me tell you. When we think about the communities, there are different areas or fields uh, through which uh, society is trying to improve environmental and social outcomes. Social services, uh, policies, urban development and planning. What is the role of education in this ecosystem of different human endeavors? And the role of schools in the ecosystem of a variety of human endeavors is really the model that we've created here. A community school. A one-stop shop. You know, being poor and being entrenched in poverty is a full-time job. It is exhausting to go from social services, to commute to a train stop, to walk to a train that may be late, to get to a job, to have your children in different school, to get up and down in buildings that don't always work. So the more we can create a one-stop shop for families, that's where you really uplift communities. You know, I spend a lot of time thinking, so many of our residents are food insecure, and that's why we want to put food right into the school. Imagine the long-term cost savings of children who didn't, and families who didn't have to stand online to get food, but could come to school, get food, get educated. Hey, would they have more family cohesion? Would they read more books? Would they spend more quality time together? Would they eat better meals with their health costs and, and health crises diminish? These are the ways we can creatively craft better outcomes for everybody through the one thing that we all need and benefit from, education. So I'm a huge advocate for community schools. Putting a medical center in a school, probably the best thing. How many kids miss doctors because they go to miss school for hours because they have a 10 minute appointment at the doctor to get their eyes checked. And they have to wait online. Put an eye check, put an eye clinic right in the school, put a dentist right in the school, let them miss 10 minutes and get them right back up to class. Makes it easier for parents, makes it easier for students. And it really gets the service done. So we've got to overhaul the way we look at schools particularly in marginalized communities, unless, of course, you're big business, because big business just wants to see them taking the train and going there and spending days. So we've got to create a level of discomfort in the status quo, and that's what community schools do well. And that's, that's what we're out. This, this is a fight, man. This is a fight. It's certainly a fight about teaching kids to learn to read and, and write and do math, but it's also a fight about equity and opportunity and access and stop setting up cycles that over extract and under resource these communities because we're the backbones of we're the backbones of the much larger economy and, and, and let's be real about that you talk a lot about regeneration and health what is the role of your program in changing or influencing social determinants of health in this community well this is a two-headed monster for sure and, and let me be clear Green Bronx Machine is dedicated to high-performing schools. At the heart of our work is curriculum. I'm not the salad guy. I'm not the garden guy. I am a building leader and an education guy. I'm a pedagogy guy. I really believe in quality of teaching and quality of learning and generating the next generation of kids who are on the same field here in the South Bronx as they are in Scarsdale. But 
There's a whole other piece to it because obesity in healthcare has become the face of poverty because of cheap food and bad policy. So when you create schools where children are healthy, where they thrive, where they don't need medicine, where they're not predis predisposed to so many pitfalls that are just waiting for them, where they can make better choices, you're uplifting their chance. You know, you don't see professional athletes, you know, knocking out cookies and cream before, before the game just because the coach wants them to feel good. So in communities like ours, you know, let's stop giving cookies and cream to kids so they feel good to come to school and let's really give them the tools and, and, and the skills that they need to navigate the world and their lives with the healthiest outcome. You know, there's a reason that the dialysis center is right next to the liquor store with the clown, the king, and the colonel on all four corners. That's very intentional. That doesn't happen in Scarsdale. It happens with a great deal of frequency right here, you know, and listen, we, we're just a few, maybe two, three miles from some of the wealthiest zip codes in all of Manhattan. But life expectancy here is often decades less. And who, who's benefiting from that? Certainly not the people living here, but big business and big farmer and everybody else. It's really time that, you know, we stop fighting the poor and start fighting poverty. Can you tell a little bit more about the role of this school and maybe other schools in changing NYC food policies? Oh, that's simple. So for far too long, schools and policy has been looking for the light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, this solution is this, or this solution will be that, or oh, we need this. No, we don't want to be the light at the end of the tunnel. We want to be the light inside of our tunnel. This classroom glows bright in the middle of the night. It sends a message that right here matters. Now matters. Every moment matters. Every decision matters. And if you can change outcomes in the poorest congressional district in America, in the least healthy county in all of New York State, in one of the most maligned neglected and exploited communities in all of New York City, you can certainly do it anywhere. And where does it start? It starts right here, man, right here in a classroom. It starts with that little student and little scholar coming through the door and a teacher that says, welcome. I'm so glad to see you today. And man, I love that cheese hat. You've traveled around the world. You have experienced so many different educational systems. What would you borrow from other examples or what are the most important things that New York City and your school can teach the world? That's a great question. I have traveled quite a few places. You know, I've seen the best of the best and not the worst of the worst because I, I mean, I've been to places where I can't imagine it worse, but I also know that we have 600 million children in the world who are not going to school. We have kids who have never seen the inside of a classroom. But I think what is the best, it, it's, I don't want to culturally appropriate anything. That's not who I am. But the examples of what I see, no matter where I am, have to do with one fundamental concept, and that is respect. When there is respect between teachers and students and students and teachers and teachers and administration, where there is a collective, wow whether you are on an earthen floor with a, with a thatched hut roof as a classroom or in a million dollar facility that is LEED Platinum certified, you know, and daylit with, you know, BPA free materials. What really matters are the people. And, and it's also about leadership for sure. Let me, you know, leader, leaders, leaders who don't value other people's uh, opinion really don't want to hear. And if you don't, they surround themselves by people who just, you know, say yes. And saying yes is what's gotten us into this mess. So it's about leadership for sure. It's about respect. The most efficient, most productive, most beautiful classrooms are one where people look each other in the eye. Regardless of materials, regardless of technology, it's a place where there is a sense of co-creation that we're in this together. Can, you, can we talk a little bit about collision, connectedness, and co-learning? Sure. 
Everything in life is about collisions, connections, and co-learning. And every day we collide. We collide with people, we collide with ideas, we collide with opposing forces. Now we can either connect or keep moving. But when you connect is the opportunity for co-learning. And that's to me what life is all about. In many ways I've become a cultural chameleon. You know, I, I'm equally comfortable here uh, in the South Bronx as I am, you know, in the Royal Palace. And I, and I say that because in many ways I'm more comfortable here in the Royal Palace, but I can handle both because I believe we collide, we connect, and if we co-learn together, there is a sense of shared ownership that makes us interconnected. Uh, you mentioned that people and events uh, make a lot of impact on who we are. What were some of the maybe moments or events of pain that may have influenced your work? Mm. There are a lot of moments of pain that have influenced my work. I've lost students. I've had children of mine, young children die. Uh, and largely it could have been preventable, which is tragic. Parents who were working so hard that they missed some of the telltale signs and we got medical intervention in this great country of ours far too late. Heartbreaking. You know, my wife and I, we buried our own son after birth. You know, and don't think we don't feel that pain daily. You know, I'm sitting here looking at you, Alex, and I remember that beautiful young baby that we had hoped to adopt. You know, and, and you know, we love that picture that you took and that picture sits in our bedroom. And you know, the, the, in some ways the system was broken then. The system was designed to perpetuate the system rather than care for people and children. So there's been pain. Listen, you know, I've stepped over dead bodies en route to coming to school. You know me, I get here early, I stay real late. What I see in the course of a day in communities like mine and certain communities around the world is mind numbing. I was in Colombia and I got in trouble for stopping in a car that I was driving with to give food and assistance to someone because I put everybody in the car at risk and I understand that now. But those things impact me in ways mm. You know, I think of my friend who runs the Nyaka Foundation for AIDS children um, in Africa, Jackson. And the only reason he became a medical doctor is because when it was time for him to go to school as a child, his parents could afford one single thing, a pencil. And had his parents not been able to afford that one pencil, that was the criteria, who knows what would have happened. Do you think that some sort of pain and hardship, at least at some level, is necessary in human life to grow into a better person, so, or we should avoid that? So absolutely, no, pain is, pain is part of the process, baby. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta deal with it, and that's what makes us grow. And let me be clear, you know, I'm a big believer in recovery, in redemption, in second and third opportunities. You know, for a lot of my uh, older adolescence and college years, you know, I was interested in feeling good. And you can feel good in a variety of ways, or even food addiction, whatever people's addictions are. You want to feel good, you want to feel better. At some point, that feeling of good becomes insanity and counterintuitive. So what motivates me is I just don't want to feel pain anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to see, I don't ever want to go to another funeral for a child, whether it was preventable, and they should all be preventable. Uh, I don't want to experience loss in my life. That's not normal. There is a part of loss and life and grieving that is normal, but I don't want to be part of an abhorrent cycle. I don't ever want to have to call a parent with bad news or comfort a parent with bad news that shouldn't have had to have that bad news. So for me, it's about pain avoidance rather than pleasure seeking. I get a lot of pleasure by avoiding pain as opposed to seeking pleasure and encountering pain. So for me, that's what kind of motivates me. Um, you know, I. I'd be wrong not to acknowledge my wife right now in talking about this, uh, you know, because I get a lot of credit for the work, but really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm some, obviously the face and often the ass of, of it, but 
So, you know, I need to shout her out. And I probably haven't been the best husband along the way either. And not because I don't love her dearly, but, you know, I'm a big glass of water to drink. I've got a lot on my mind. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, when you ask me to get vulnerable, I, I need to be a better husband, um, for sure. Um, I need better balance in my life, for sure. But I think, and I'm working on that. I need to take better care of me. You know, I'm at a milestone age in my life where I really need to think about how do I keep the machine of Stephen um, as efficient and well-oiled and preserved and maintained as possible so I can continue to do this work. And I'm very fortunate to have the most loving, beautiful wife in the world. Trust you me. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a daughter who adores me and who I adore and who collectively we love spending time with. I think if the events of the past few years haven't taught us that self-care is important, I don't know what will. If the divisiveness that we are encountering in our nation and in the world doesn't teach us that we need to not only speak, but also to listen, and not only to listen, but to hear, I don't know what will. So you need to cherish and value those who are near to you, so I do that. But you know, you can take good care of yourself. You can make decisions in your life that ultimately will lead to a better life long term, as opposed to some kind of immediate, ever changing, you know, newfangled this and newfangled that. So take good care of yourself. You know, put the phones down, look up and see the sun, fall in love, get some sleep, you know, listen to the birds, look at the stars, read a book. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Listen to water and be kind. kind. You know, kindness just radiates in ways no one will go broke giving love. And, you know, how do I nourish myself? I'm, I'm working on, on better plans for that for sure. But I think the greatest sustenance beyond my own immediate family is my extended family of colleagues and students who lift me up daily, who just make me excited to come through the door every day, that make me hate going to bed and not up soon enough, you know? Uh, I'm a guy, you know, it's very funny. I can't go to sleep if I see one light on. And I live in New York City, so there are a lot of lights on. I live in the Bronx. But if I see one light on, I'm like, man, that guy's working smarter than me. That guy's working harder than me. And if I get up in the morning and I see a light on and someone's sitting there at their desk, I'm like, you know, that person, they're, they're, they're getting ahead of me. So, uh, you know, you got to find pace. You got to find balance. Um, but I stay up at night dreaming. I really, really do. And it's, you know, nourish those who nourish you and just expand your reach, expand your reach. Talk and don't be afraid to take a risk. Don't put yourself in harm's way. But don't be, you know, you don't have to set yourself on fire to heat a cold room. You know, you've got to find better ways to do that. Can you comment on how your childhood, your parents influenced who you are? So, you know, I am the product of an amazing family. My dad is an immigrant who came to this country, couldn't speak a lick of English, and moved his family from the Lower East Side to the Bronx in a wheelbarrow at 11 years of age. So, understand, that's part of my DNA. I have Holocaust survivors in my family. My parents worked. They worked two, three jobs. They really worked hard. But I had two great, one, I had amazing grandparents on both sides. And um, one who was confined to a wheelchair her whole life, who never left her apartment, but knew everything about the world through a radio and a book. And, you know, I was kind of like her little gopher. And then I had another, and, you know, the, the amazing thing is, you know, I could have, I could do something egregious. And my grandmother, well, there was a reason for that, you know. Um, you know, I hate to use the analogy of a former president, but, you know, I could shoot someone. And my grandma, that's okay. They probably deserve to die. You know, you probably did the world a favor, you know. Um, you know, I was getting in trouble a lot in school. I was an outlier. And, you know, that's okay. They just don't understand them. They probably need to learn how to teach children like Stephen. So I was very blessed in that regard. I had another grandmother who adored me. Um, I had aunts and uncles who I loved seeing. And we rolled as a family. Some days, some days it was like a rugby scrum if you will. Um, some days it felt like uh, the WWF closed cage match. But at the end of the day, we always knew we were going to hug and shake hands and love. You know, my dad never missed a day of work. God rest his soul. He went to work for 52 years daily, never missed a day of work. What did your parents do? Uh, so 
My dad was a clerk. He met, they, my parents met at work, believe it or not. My mom was working in an accounting apartment and couldn't do math, and my dad was working in a mailroom and couldn't read English. Um, so it was the perfect setting for, for love and you know, co-creation, if you will, and coexistence and collaboration. You know, um, I miss my dad terribly. I really do. And, you know, in talking about this, you know, if your parents are out there, call them. Tell them you love them um, while you still can. Um, that's the takeaway uh, for me right now. But, you know, there are teachers who believed in me. And I remember every teacher who believed in me from elementary school. Not too many believed in me in middle school. I had a couple in high school who I loved. And, of course, listen, you know, in college, I was a disaster. I was asked to graduate elsewhere. I struggled. Then I struggled in graduate school because I wasn't prepared. You know, I came through college and got a degree. That's a whole separate conversation um, because that was an economic system as opposed to a real, you know, merit system. Where did you go to college? Where did I start or where did I finish? <laughs> That's the big question. You know, I started at the University of California and it wasn't their fault. It was mine. I can own it. But I was very clearly asked to graduate elsewhere. I would love to come back. So I'm hoping that, you know, one day I get to speak at University of California, Davis. I remember my room number. I think I owe them some library books. Um, but, you know, to think remarkably that it was an agricultural school and I went there just because it was far away. I had California dreams. I had seen Animal House. Uh, that was my big motivation. Um, but I would very much love to come back to the University of California and, and get involved with them and the amazing work that they're doing. And to think I actually became an urban farmer in an ag school uh, is, really, uh, is really remarkable. So it's a virtuous cycle for sure. But you graduated from another school. Yeah, I graduated from the State University of New York and purchased an art school. Uh, I kind of, and we'll leave it at that, very grateful for the opportunity. I think I'm coming up on a very big reunion soon. Um, but, you know, the place that I really learned about school was Arizona State University. And, you know, I had a college professor and advisor who I write about in the book, Stan Zucker, who took a chance on me when no one else ever would have or could have or should have. And he did. And he really taught me the difference between incompetence and noncompliance. And the answer, no matter what, is to teach to both. And Stan and I stay in touch to this day. I'm forever grateful for him. And, uh, you know, he took a chance on me when my life was a mess. You know, my intention was good, but my actions were often different. And, you know, intention without action is just a waste of time. So, you know, you got you to gotta do shit. That's the bottom line. You, you know, there are people who talk, talk, talk. I don't consider myself a professional talker. I consider myself, as we sit here in this classroom, a professional doer. And uh, I learn from doing. And so do children. Steven, do you read books? And if so, do you have any recommendations? Do I read books? Look at the size of these glasses. Of course I read books. There are two books I want to talk about. So thank you for asking. One is Americans Who Tell the Truth by Robert Shetterly. Um, one of the most seminal books of my career. Um, Robert is an amazing, he was a writer, became an artist, Harvard educated, and then after the war, decided that he wanted to dedicate himself to people who told the truth. And Robert's an older gentleman. He lives in Maine. He's white. He could pass for Santa Claus, you know. And I say that because he came to the South Bronx and met my students, and it could have been the requiem for disaster. It was the ultimate collision, connection, and co-learning because he looked them right in the eyes and told them the truth and encouraged them to tell their truths in a system and in a school that was really very dysfunctional. And, you know, Robert has gone on to paint hundreds and hundreds of, of portraits of famous Americans um, who have had tremendous fears of influence in every aspect of society, whether it's environment, government, sports, LGBTQ, you name the whistleblowing. And his art is amazing. So it, it's, a, it's an amazing book to read. And then remarkably, 10 years after meeting him, he painted my portrait um, in my cheese hat. So, I mean, and not because he painted my portrait and my suggestion that you read the book. I'm suggesting you read the book to learn about how many great Americans there have been who have told the truth. From children to senior citizen, from little children to Frederick Douglass. Um, who really keep telling the truth and inspire the next generation of truth tellers because the truth will ultimately set us free. So 
Please, Americans Who Tell the Truth by Robert Shetterly, and there's a great website to support it. And then I love Maya Angelou. You know, poetry. Because every caged bird should sing. And in a world that is incredibly mean, we can astonish it and be kind and love on each other and make it better. I love Abel's Island. I love of mice of men. I love the old man in the sea. There is a Cahill Capron, the prophet. There is a, and you know, I always say that we are all people of the book. So whatever book you are from or not from, get in there and read it. It's good to learn about other places and other people. If you traveled in time and space, Go what back. suggestions would you give yourself? I think everybody speaks, but very few people listen. So I would learn to listen better as a young child and, and as a young adult, as even a new teacher or an intermediate teacher. And you know, the best, you know, in a world where there is a lot of injustice, and let me be clear, there is a lot of injustice. You don't need to shout it all out. Just living well is the best revenge. There is nothing stronger than the power of example. And I think why I've been able to be effective more recently, as opposed to 20 some odd years of advocacy, as I was saying, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. But when you get out there and do some right, that's the way you leave the world a little better than you found it. So uh, speak less and do more. You know, and don't be angry. And of course, you know, the, the great advice that I got from State Senator Gustavo Rivera, uh, just as Green Bronx Machine was being born, and to whom I still speak with and adore to this very day, you can't drink from a fire hose. So always be a cool, refreshing sip of water that makes people want to come back and get more instead of being blown away. So drip, drip, drip. Every drop fills the cup. And you don't have to be the ocean. You can be a small wave and just make a lot of ripples. What advice do you have for school principals? How to build a better environment for teachers to thrive and to offer better educational programs? So that's a great question. And, you know, leadership matters. So you need to listen to people. But I would like for leaders to stop thinking about schools as institutions and more as organisms. And what do I mean? We've got mental institutions, penal institutions, government institutions. Those fixed entities create such a closed mindset. You know, schools need to evolve. Humans need to evolve. The world is evolving. So I want leadership to really think not so institutionally, but more evolutionarily living, breathing entities. You know, things don't always have to be in a right order. Now, we need systems for sure. But what goes on in a classroom can look very different classroom to classroom, and it should, because children are different, and we need to meet them where we're at. And again, let's be clear. I write about this in my book. You know, when we put a seed in the ground and that plant doesn't grow, we don't blame the plant, we blame the environment. So when we put children in schools and children don't thrive because every child can thrive, I've never met a child who cannot thrive. It's just how are we going to enable that scenario? We need to look at the institution. We need to give children the same respect we give plants because when children aren't thriving, there's a reason. It's not always the children. I think the collective intellect of adults in society can figure that out. So we've got to stop selling our children short. Great, I'm so glad you're here. Come on, I'm going to show you our garden. And this is the most productive garden per square foot in all of New York City. This garden was built by children, painted by children. We call it the Claremont Village Community Garden. It is home to art. The kids decorated the boxes. But we grow tomatoes. We grow cucumbers. We grow peppers. We grow all kinds of things, flowers. It goes on and on and on, but most importantly, it's a beautiful message that food justice is racial justice and the spirit of si se puede lives everywhere because we have a fundamental belief that children will never be well read if they are not well fed and we can all be friends. So in a community that has been struggling for years to bring unity, the garden is a place where we can all get along. This garden opens up onto 45,000 residents. We're growing eggplants over here. 
We've got tomatoes here. You'll notice that the garden, even though it's late September, is still filled with bees. We've got annuals, perennials. This right here is going to become a weather station, an outdoor classroom. Uh, right now, we're just doing some renovation. And on the other side, we have an additional... Good morning. Thank you for being here. Great to see you guys. We have a very important message for our children. So, the owl's always here because we're always watching, but the most important school supply in the world is food. And we're going collard greens, a Thanksgiving meal here. We're proud to be partnering with the New York City Department of Education, the New York State Education Department, the New York City Food Policy Center, and of course, the Center for Food is Medicine. And literally, you see the copious amounts of food that we are growing here. Right here is an amazing pergola built by our overage, undercredited workforce development students that has a fully sub-irrigated watering system. This is the most productive school garden per square foot in America with five inches of soil. All the soil that you see here is compost generated from food waste from New York City and from the school cafeteria. So this is an incredibly virtuous cycle and no one could be more proud of this community or its residents than me and themselves. And again, this garden is maintained by the community, open, people come in here, they plant, they harvest, they do. So from the Bronx to the world, see, si se puede.